I now invite Dr. Bala Ramachandran. Um, he is the director in charge and the head of the ICU here at Child's Trust Hospital. The ICU is of central importance here at Child's Trust Hospital. Sir runs a world-class ICU and uh, if Dr. Thiru sleeps well at night after doing all these difficult cases, it's probably because of uh, our ICU. Uh, Dr. Bala Ramachandran also lives very far from the hospital and rides a very fancy bike to work. Everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So when Dr. Theru asked me to talk during the conference, I said, yeah, I'll be, uh, you know, fine, what do you want me to speak on? Uh, so he said, uh, tracheos I said, yeah, no problem. Uh, yeah, how long? He said, it's a one-hour session. I said, one hour a tracheos care. Okay, no, no, there are two talks. I said, okay, that's fine. No, no problem. Then he said, no, no, there is also a panel discussion. Then I said, okay, then how long do I have? He said, 15 minutes. I said, 15 minutes, tracheost me care. Okay, I'll see what I can do. No, no, you also have to cover decannulation. Okay. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, I cannot cover all of this in 15 minutes. So, I'm telling Dr. Theru now itself, I'll take a few more minutes. Okay. So, um. Before the police comes Okay. So, uh, anyway, uh, I'm not an ENT surgeon. So you all know that I take care of children in the ICU and afterwards. So I'm not going to talk about any of the surgical aspects. And I am also not going to speak on the immediate post-operative care or ICU care. Instead, I'm going to concentrate on home care because that is extremely important for, uh, you know, for the success of our patients. So we say, before I start uh, disclosures, I have no relationships, financial or otherwise, with any of the products that may be shown in my talk um, um, or, uh, you know, mentioned in the talk. So home care is extremely important. When I first started out here, uh, we had in fellowship, we had a big tracheostomy team. The tracheostomy is done by the surgeon. We provide the care in the ICU and that's the end of it. Somebody else, there's a team there which teaches their family. We knew nothing about it. So I came here. And I said, okay, tracheos me, fine. Okay, so then I said, teach the patient. So you have to teach the patient. Okay, so, so I don't know how to take care of the tracheos me. So no, you better learn very fast. So since then, we started learning. And uh, what I have done is all my fellows, I make them teach the family so that they get to be good at it. And in turn, they can teach their juniors when this, uh, so on and so forth. So it's actually that, you know, we have very good surgeons. The problem is, once you tell the family you have to go home with this tube in the airway and without it the child can't breathe, they are scared. And I don't blame them. I would be scared too. They are really scared. So it's really daunting. So it's important for us to teach them properly, train them properly, make them practice because these are really the keys to success for proper home care of the tracheostomy. So what do we do at home? We tell them, you know, again, you know, uh, the uh, immediate post-op care was just dealt with by the previous speaker. Uh, one thing is to keep the stoma clean and dry. That's common sense. If it's wet, then you're going to get infection. You're going to get uh, maceration. You're going to get fungus, uh, etc. You have to keep it dry. Okay. Uh, granulomas can be formed. The... Um, we usually say clean only with sterile water or if you have a lot of secretions, use half-strength hydrogen peroxide. We tell them not to use betadine because betadine is actually irritating to the mucosa and if a little bit gets inside, it's going to cause more of a problem. So don't use betadine. Just peroxide, if at all, half-strength is more than enough. Then sometimes you may need some antifungal and uh, a little bit of ant uh, steroid cream, etc., but not routinely. <clears throat> what about tube changes? Again, when I first started off here, I asked uh, one of the people working in the government hospital, uh, you send home children and tracheos me? Yes. When do you change the tube? Oh, we never change the tube. So I said, no, that can't be done. So we do have to change the tube regularly. How regular? There is actually no consensus on that even now after so many years. But most often we say once a week and I tell my families at least change it once a week so that they keep those skills. If you don't change it um, periodically, you forget how to do it and in an emergency you won't be able to do that. And when you take the tube out, inspect it, inspect the stoma, inspect the tube, is it blocked with secretions, etc. And in, uh, in the West, you would throw the tube out and put a new one. Here, we can't afford to do that, so we reuse the tubes. And I say clean the tubes with half-stench peroxide, again, to remove the secretions, works very well. 
uh, with water and some mild detergent, rinse it with sterile water, air dry it, put it in a little plastic dabba after it is dry and store it. So you don't have to use a sterile tube each time. You can keep on reusing these tubes. The problem with PVC tubes or standard Portex tubes, etc., is they stiffen at body temperature if you keep them in for a long time, usually about in three to four uh, months. Silicone tubes are available uh, nowadays and they remain flexible. They're great if you can get them. But if you keep on rotating these tubes, uh, you can use an individual tube for six or 12 months because they're not going to be in all the time you're changing them out. We usually send them home with not with one, but we send them with two tubes um, because one is in the patient. One has been removed for cleaning and you always have one more which is always ready to use as a spare. What about cuffs? As far as possible, we will not send a child with a cuff tube at home because it's a little more um, um, <clears throat> care is involved in them. We saw the cuff pressure gauge in the previous uh, uh, talk, but at home it's hard to do all of this. We prefer not to send them home with a cuff tube. If at all they need a cuff tube, they're on a home vent or something, we can't tell them to look at the pressure. Instead, in the hospital, what we will see is we will see how much pressure is needed, how much uh, volume of air is needed to get to your ideal pressure. And then we tell the parents, you inflate the cuff with so many ml of air. Okay, because that's easier than telling them keep the pressure so much or uh, below so much, below 20 or below 30 or whatever. Ideally, in the hospital, we like to keep it below 20. <coughs> Very important, tracheostomy ties. Okay, these are all simple things, but extremely important. If they're not done right, they can cause problems. We have three types of ties, twill tape. This is the twill tape which comes with the uh, tracheostomy. Unfortunately, you can't buy them separately. What we end up using is petticoat nada, which is doesn't really work great because it's cotton, it'll absorb moisture, etc. And it's got, you know, it's frays. It's hard to get into the uh, little hole. Uh, you know, the flange, etc. Beaded metal chains, I haven't found them in India, but now Velcro tapes are available. Very nice. I'll show them in a next slide. Okay. We have to, the ties can irritate the skin, so you have to change them every time they get soiled. Okay. And you have to, what we teach them is before you remove the tie, put the other tie in. And always, you know, make sure that one side of the uh, uh, tracheostomy tube is tied at all times. Don't remove both of them together. It's better. So we'll, when you're putting the new uh, tube in, one side will already be tied. Then we pass it around so that you don't have the risk of a tracheostomy tube when the child is wriggling, etc. It coming out accidentally. And it should be just of the right tightness so you can put one finger through it. So it's not too tight. It's not too loose for obvious reasons. Okay, so I mentioned these are available now. They're great, excellent uh, Velcro, very easy to use. Parents love it. Comes with a piece of sponge here, uh, which um, sometimes if the tube is too long, we can use it. It will elevate the tube uh, so that it doesn't hit the carina, all of those. But there is a problem. It's available. These are only 200 rupees each, by the way. Um, <clears throat> the problem is they're made in only one size for adults, and then we can't use them for children. So what we did here is I asked one of my fellows to make, go and measure, and then we made a standard thing for all these various sizes, and then measured these lengths and these lengths and this size here, and that's what we have on the table. So depending on the size of the child, I just tell the family, take four or five of these, go to your local tailor who sits uh, on the street, and have him cut this and convert it into this, whichever. It's easy, you know, makes life easy, it's cheap, and it works very well. What about other issues? Suctioning, as was already mentioned, uh, you know, has to be taught. How deep to go? We don't like the full deep suction because it's going to damage the mucosa. Pre-measured technique with, ideally with a graduated suction catheter. Otherwise, we tell them so many centimeters, don't go beyond that. How often, again, this depends on how much secretions you have. The parents will usually learn very quickly how often, but we say at least once in the morning and once in the night. Okay. Routine saline installation, not really needed, has not been shown to improve anything. Catheter size, the largest catheter that will go in comfortably, so you can, uh, you can remove the secretions well. 
Sterile versus clean. Sterile technique we usually use in the hospital, which means sterile gloves and sterile catheter. Clean technique is a clean gloves, uh, clean hands with a clean catheter. At home, you really don't need a sterile catheter. So we tell them to use one catheter for the whole day. Clean the outside of the catheter with alcohol after they're done. Remember, the outside of the cat catheter is what comes. The inside is not going to touch the patient. It, everything is going in one way. Okay, hopefully. Pressure is very important, 80 to 100 milligram, uh, millimeters of mercury. Anything beyond this can damage the mucosa if you touch it. So we have to teach them about this. And I always send them home with two suction machines. One is an electric one. One is a manual one because power fails in <coughs> India. So you never know. I actually had a very nice video, which I couldn't find yesterday, of a man suctioning his grandchild's tracheostomy with the Dilly tap, uh, mucus strap. The, he's holding the child. He's suctioning and he's sucking on the other end of the trap. <laughs> okay, but it works, whatever works. Uh, and apply suction while you're both inserting and removing the catheter. People usually say you put it in and then you uh, suction, but then you're going to risk pushing the secretions into the trachea. Okay, humidification, very, very important depending on where you live. In the ICU, we can use a tracheostomy collar. At home, usually, you know, uh, we end up using a piece of moist gauze, but an HME is far better. They are expensive, adds to the cost, but we say you don't have to change it every day. Uh, change it only once in two days or three days uh, unless it is blocked. It also depends on where you guys work. Chennai, uh, Madras is a very humid place, so it's not as bad. You, but if you're going to live in a dry place, you're in Delhi, etc., you're definitely going to need some form of humidification. Otherwise, you're going to run up uh, with problems. I'm not going to, I mean, I'm sure you all know the importance of humidification. Very, very important, and I'm, again, very happy the previous session dealt with swallowing. We have a lack of speech-language pathologists in India who deal with tracheostomies, and especially in children. You know, they're all, they uh, do very well with non, you know, standard children with speech problems, but tracheostomy, it's difficult. So now, thankfully, you know, things are getting improving slowly. Uh, these kids new, need to communicate. So there are many ways, sign board, sign language, speaking well, swallowing assessment we spoke about in the previous slide. How many of you use uh, speaking well, by the way? I see very few hands here. Speaking wells are amazing. I see very few hands. So um, these are all available in India. Passy Muir speaking well. Uh, David Muir was actually a tracheos an engineer who had a tracheostomy, so he made this valve. These are available. They're a little expensive. They're about 10,000 rupees each, but you get a Smith's brand, which is 2,000 rupees, but it's not as good. These are fantastic. And uh, this is a young child who un unfortunately had to have a tracheostomy after she came here. The minute we put the speaking valve on her, she started crying and, you know, her, and she was able to speak and, you know, the everything changed. The parent's outlook changed. The child was happy. So these are excellent. Speaking valves are excellent. Only caveat is you need to have either a fenestrated tube or a leak around the tube. Uh, you can't put a speaking valve on a tight tube or a cuff tube. Uh, and, you know, the child can't exhale. Okay. Long-term tubes, lovely shyly tubes, which are available here, fenestrated, non-fenestrated, etc. The only problem is they're available only in size six and above. So they're more of use for older children and adults. They are very good tubes, reusable, but these are also available. The, sorry, the silicone tubes are also available. There is a little supply problem with the Bivona tubes, uh, but it's expected to be uh, sorted out. And they're not that expensive, uh, and they're very good. They last for a very long time. So these are far better than the um, PVC tubes. Most important is education of the caregiving team. So what we say is, you know, it's great to do all these procedures but once you send them home, you want to make sure that the child is taken care of. So you have to train them. You have to give them the technical skills and the decision-making skills. It's not enough to know how to change the tracheostomy tube. It's important to know when to change it. So that is also important. And what we say is teach at least two responsible adults. One, it's not enough. Sometimes we provide nursing give them a manual, give them a list of supplies, make them practice in the hospital. We also teach them basic life support in the hospital. Tracheostomy dummies are available. 
uh, for training. They're very expensive, unfortunately. So what I did was I took our PALS training dummy and made a hole in the neck here. Uh, the hole goes through the artificial trachea behind it, and this works well. I didn't tell anybody that I'm going to do it, otherwise they'll say, no, no, the dummy costs so much money, you can't make a hole in it. So now nobody minds. This is great for, the, you know, for training purposes. Home care, these are available free on the net. They're very old, but you can search for them. They're free. They're excellent. And my long-term project, which I still haven't done, is I want to translate this into Tamil and Telugu. Uh, so, you know, some of my fellows are here, so you guys want to take up the project, it'll go on your references. Okay. Uh, these are really good, you know, they're excellent. Now, this is important, home care supplies, you need a list of supplies, and this was actually made for me by a mother 20 years ago. And if I can open it, For whatever reason, I'm not able to show that. Whoops, there was something there. Okay, I, I'm not able to show that. It's basically a Word document giving a list of the entire supplies that are needed, which, uh, you know, in 20 years, it really hasn't changed. And we individualize it to each patient. We take the default thing. It makes life easy because you don't forget things. We say, okay, this child has so many years, this needs such and such a size of a suction catheter, such and such a size of tracheostomy, spare tube of this size, uh, and so on and so forth. Are they tube fed? Are they fed by mouth? Then additional supplies, all of these things. If anybody wants the list, I'm happy to share it with Thiru and he can uh, uh, share it to you all. Uh, but it's very useful to have something like this. Also useful for teaching the juniors, the uh, fellows, what all you need for a tracheostomy when you're sending them home with a tracheostomy. Okay, now we'll go on to decannulation very quickly. And this is, by the way, called the tracheosaurus. I learned that yesterday when I was searching for that. Okay. Now, there are varying protocols, but most of them are based only on expert opinion. There are really no hard and fast, good quality data for this. And varying success rates, but success rates are usually good. So how do you decide when the patient is ready for decannulation? Not when the patient comes and asks you. You know, we have to decide. Okay, first of all, the original indication for the tracheostomy must be better. Second, the comorbidities must have either improved or, you know, uh, resolved completely. And thirdly, you're not planning to do any elective surgery. Suppose you want to, you have a child with a tracheostomy, you're planning to do some kind of surgery one month later, wait for a month. What's the big deal in decannulating them now, then only to go and reintubate them a month later? Doesn't make sense. Okay, so these are the prerequisites uh, from the American Association of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery Foundation. No ventilator requirement for three months. I find this useful because whenever parents come and say, Doc, he's off the vent, can you remove the tracheostomy? I say, no, wait for some time. No aspiration events or need for pulmonary toilet. At least one vocal cord should be mobile. Bronchoscopic evidence of airway patency. And then a successful daytime capping trial for several weeks. Now, we don't follow this to the letter, but this is a general guideline which we can use. The ideal decannulation protocol, complete airway evaluation, do a capping trial, a capped polysomnogram, um, reduce, you know, gradual reduction of the trach size, admission, decannulation, and observation. Of course, this is the ideal one, uh, but we don't, again, we modify it. What are the risk factors for decannulation failure? One, you have physical factors such as granulomas, uh, uh, stenosis above or below the glottis. Uh, malacia is important. And adenotonsillar hypertrophy, because you're bypassing that hypertrophy with the tube. If you haven't taken care of it and you remove the tube, then you will have problems. Functional factors like poor swallowing reflexes, poor secretion management, intermittent apneas, any pulmonary comorbidities, hypotonia. So all of these are functional factors which will increase the chance of failure. The other important thing, there was a very nice study of almost 190 decannulations by somebody called Bandopadhyay in the US. And one of the factors he had shown was tracheostomy decannulation done because of parental pressure has more than twice the failure rate, 55% versus 22%. And this is important, very highly significant. 
so if because it's the parents will pressurize us remove the tracheostomy many time they won't come to me because uh, i won't let them they'll go straight to the ent surgeon <laughs> i've seen that also happen so if you go and do remove it because of parental pressure alone without satisfying the other criteria you're setting yourself up for more than twice the chance of failure okay so what is our protocol here we do an airway endoscopy uh, definitely flexible maybe rigid depending on what is found uh, at uh, the flexible endoscopy if they are ready then we admit them plan and admit them i'll try to admit them in the icu is less busy downsize the tube cap the tube either in the uh, step down unit or in the icu monitor in the daytime with continuous pulse oximetry if we tolerate it monitor for one more day and then we remove it okay and there are two kinds of decannulations one is the medical decannulation we remove it at the bedside and put a uh, plaster on top of the stoma observe for 1 to 2 days uh, in the hdu or icu surgical decannulation the tube is removed in the theater by dr thiru uh, they excise the tract and close it and then observe for 2 or 3 days until the wound heals polysomnogram is actually done far less frequently here because one it's harder to get two it's expensive so we don't uh, you know we don't do it routinely only in selected cases if dr thiru wants it then we'll get it done okay so these are our data up to last year uh, you know 2008 to 2211 tracheostomies but for this these data i haven't updated in the past one year so about 40% success rate till then say a uh, 60% still were not decannulated at that time most of them were medical decannulation uh some of them about 11 had um, early complications and late complications and about 16 granulation suprastomal collapse and so on and so forth so, so these were the uh, complications we saw uh i think yeah so in conclusion the tracheostomy care is a team effort we all know that it's not just the ent surgeon it's the icu team it's the parents that's very important the family members are very important you have to educate them we try to remove as soon as possible and uh, that's a shared goal we are between the doctors and the families you need a stepwise decannulation protocol which makes life easy remember comorbidities can you turn that off for a minute turn turn the light off for a minute please thank you comorbidities increase the failure so i that's the last one i just have one more slide and this is the best tracheostomy which is actually not a tracheostomy okay we try not to do it at all this is a child with diphtheria dr kalen spoke about uh, this yesterday having a nasal endotracheal tube so this is a child with diphtheria he's walking to the bathroom uh with uh, normally we would have ended up doing a tracheostomy in these children but here he was a big boy he was very cooperative so we put a nasal tube and he handled it beautifully no tracheostomy he was happy he was sitting and writing his uh, whatever he wanted to communicate so we can do all of these kind of things if you uh you know think outside the box and say no every airway obstruction i will do a tracheostomy you don't have to do that thank you very much ladies and gentlemen thank you dr bala ramachandran that was a great talk and i'm sure everybody is taking home a lot of messages from this talk